that no matter what happens to us, they will not let this movement go. On this land where our First Nation brothers and sisters lived free. We come here from every corner because there are unnecessarily 140 poor and low wealth people in this country. That's 43% of the nation, 52% of our children, 66 million white people, 26 million black people, 60.9% of black people, 68% of Latinos and natives, and more than 60% of Asians who are entangled in the unjust weed of poverty and bound up by the interlocking realities of systemic racism, voter suppression, refusal to pay a living minimum wage, bad tax policy, ecological devastation, denial of health care, inequitable educational opportunity, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. Here we are today. This level of poverty and greed in this, the richest nation in the history of the world, constitutes a moral crisis and a fundamental failure of the policies of greed. These numbers and interlocking injustices are not just about debates between right and left and moderate. No, this language and categories are too puny for what we face. They represent a crisis of democracy, a shared failure to center poor and low wealth people, the very people who are the greatest moral leaders and survivors in our society and the true bellwether of our well-being. But there is something else that is even more grotesque. The regressive policies which produce 140 million poor and low wealth people are not benign. They are forms of policy murder. We know that prior to the pandemic, poor people died at a rate of 700 people a day, 250,000 a year. Poor people have been two to five times more likely to die from COVID during this pandemic so far. And we know this can't simply be explained away by vaccination results. It's related to the discrimination in our policies toward poor and low wealth people. On Monday of this week, the National Academy of Science said more than 330,000 lives could have been saved in during the pandemic if we had simply had a policy of universal health care for all people. A policy which is a human right that should never be connected to your job, but always connected to your humanity. Because many of the people you see here today know these realities, know this pain, this injustice, and this death from personal experience. We knew that we must gather here. We must have, over and over again, a moral meeting in these streets. We are not unlike our forerunners who sought to mend every flaw of this nation. The abolitionists, those who fought against lynching, those who have stood for families, those who have stood for labor rights, those who have stood for civil rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights and the right for women to control their own bodies, those who have stood for peace in the time of war, those who have demanded that children be treated right, and those who have demanded just immigration policies in a nation full of immigrants. All of these people have come to these same streets to openly expose the moral crises throughout our history. This sacred moral procession has been required at various points in our history to exorcise the demons of greed and hate and racism in our society. They have all recognized that there comes a time we must have a moral meeting, and such is this moment now. 
This is why we are here, and we won't be silent anymore. We come to this mass poor people's low-wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington and to the polls because we must meet this moment. We must meet in the streets. We must meet at the ballot box. We must meet at the political suites of this nation. We have to cry loud from the pulpits and the public square. And we know we're on solid ground from which to raise our critique. Our great moral and constitutional traditions, they give us solid ground to declare that we must establish justice and ensure equal protection under the law for all people. We know that when the nation is moving away from the principles of life, liberty, justice, the pursuit of happiness for all people, and there's been a long train of abuses, that and the nation has become more profitable for a few and less perfect for others, we must correct the nation and we can't be silent anymore. We know that our greatest moral traditions in Scripture call us to stand up, call us to mourn and refuse to be quiet. Is it not Isaiah that said, Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey? Holy Scripture from every place calls us to repentance in a time of crisis. From Amos to Isaiah, to the Gospels of Jesus, we are told we must gather a remnant of people who are willing to cry in the public square. We know that there are moments when in the anointing we must declare good news to the poor and recovery of sight to the blind. We must remind every nation that no matter how great she claims her gross domestic product is, or how powerful her military year is. Every nation is under divine judgment until they fully care and fully love for the least of these, the hungry, the outcast, and the left out. And we know that every religious tradition, from Judaism to Islam to Unitarianism, not only believe the divine moral of the universe at lit, exists, but moves us by the Spirit to bend the moral law with the weight of our nonviolent actions. Today, make no mistake, America, we are determined to bend the moral law right here once again in America. We are resolved not to stop until we no longer have to fight. We are resolved not to stop until we no longer have breath to breathe or strength to give. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And together with our allies, we won't be silent anymore. We are not, we are not here to beg, but to demand. What we're at demanding is not radical, it's simply right. We've come to put a face and a voice on these numbers of poverty to show that behind them, inside them, are real people and real lives. They are us. We are them. And we won't be silent anymore. The very fact that these realities exist means, Dr. West, that we are engaged in a moment that is constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible, politically insensitive, economic, and economically insane. As the great prophet of the Harlem Renaissance declared, we must take back our mighty land again. America has never been America to me, but we swear this oath that America will be. We must say with our bodies, with our voices, with our organizing, with our preaching, with our standing, even with our suffering and our sacrifices, that we won't be silent or unseen or unheard anymore. 
as long as there are 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. And we know it doesn't have to be this way. We won't be silent anymore. As long as there are 87 million people who are uninsured or underinsured, and everybody in the Congress gets free health insurance while they vote against us to have the same thing, we won't be silent anymore. As long as caving to the lobbying of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce 49 Republicans and two Democrats refused to vote fairly and denied 32 million people just last year a $15 an hour minimum living wage. We won't be silent anymore. As long as we know this nation will never really deal with inflation and recession until she does right by the poor and low wealth of this country. As long as we have the hypocrites the, uh, and the audacity to call people essential workers during the pandemic and then treat them like they're expendable when it comes to health care and wages. As long as two Democrats and four Republicans block child income tax credits, lift folk up for a few months out of poverty and then drop them right back to hell in poverty, we won't be silent anymore. As long as people keep asking how much will it cost, rather than ask the real cost question, how much does it cost for things to stay like they are? As long as there are the lies of scarcity and the lies we don't know what to do. As long as we have the stealing of native lands and unjust immigration. As long as your health and your income can be determined by who you love. As long as people go to bed hungry, as long as millions of our neighbors are homeless or facing homelessness, as long as four million people can get up every morning and buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water, as long as our military spends twice as much as Iran, Iraq, Russia, and North Korea combined, and we know that just 10% of that bloated military budget could provide health care and public education. We won't be silent anymore. As long as 55 million people are facing voter suppression, let us be clear, we are not simply here for a day. This assembly is to declare the full commitment of a fusion coalition. If you didn't know America, you better ask somebody. We are black, we are brown, we are native, we are Latino, we are Asian, we are young, we are old, we are gay, we are straight, we are trans, we are independent, we are from California to the Carolinas, from Massachusetts to Mississippi, from Georgia to the Great Lakes, from the Apache lands, to Alabama, to Appalachia, from Montana, to Missouri, from Alaska, to Arkansas, and we ain't going nowhere. Now is the time for a third reconstruction. We are the rejected who've been rejected by the politics of trickle-down economics and rejected by neoliberalism. 150 years ago, black and poor whites built the first Reconstruction. Over 50 years ago, black and white people and Latinos joined people of faith and followed the prophetic servant leader, Martin Luther King, and took on racism, poverty, and militarism, and a second Reconstruction. But now is our time for a third Reconstruction. We are not an insurrection, but we are a resurrection. And this is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day that the stones that the builders rejected are coming together to be the cornerstone of a new reality. And so make no mistake, from the State House.
to the Congress, to the White House. This is no one day on and one day off. This is a movement until children are protected, until sick folk are healed, until low-wage workers are paid, until immigrants are treated fairly, until affordable houses are provided, until the atmosphere, the land, and the water are protected, until saving the world and diplomacy and living in peace is more important than blowing up the world. We won't be silent anymore. If we've got to march, we'll march. If we've got to engage in non-violent direct action, we'll engage. If we've got to give more attention with the media, we'll do it. If we have to ask workers to make election day a labor strike day, as long as God is God, as long as politicians are hurting the people that God won't heal, we say to America, you have made a promise, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What a day, what a day, that will be, but until then,